Hi guys. Thank you once again for tuning into my channel. Today I'd like to assemble different bits and pieces and try to deliver a general overview of this forgotten history and lost land of Tartaria. When I go to Google and I type in the population of the Earth, it says that 7.4 billion people live here. So when I go to, to YouTube and I search for, for Tartaria and two of my videos show up as the top results, I scratch my head a little bit as to why out of 7.4 billion people I'm one of the only few English speakers that's actually making videos on Tartaria. Now I'm not showing off. In fact, I'll try to answer the question, do I think I'm qualified to talk on Tartaria? No, I don't. I haven't studied the subject broadly enough to even draw conclusions. But seeing as nobody else is making videos on Tartaria, and I'd love to see more videos, well, I guess I'll just make a video myself. I have a lot of personal opinions, kind of like the ones I just expressed, and I will try to leave those in the description below and in the comments section below because I'd like to get into covering this material sooner than later. So here goes. Okay, so in one of my recent videos, uh, this one in particular, Uzbekistan and maps of Tartaria, I got some very nice comments from everybody, but in particular I got a comment from Andrei Eugenievich and I, he had some opinions about Tartaria and yeah some opinions and some ideas for fu future research material so I responded and I said that I appreciate what he said and if he could um, point me in the right direction and provide some more links and descriptions and he certainly did he spent a lot of time giving me some careful comments and insight and so much material that I haven't even looked at all of it yet but he really did uh, take the trouble to explain it to me unfortunately I'd love to see a video made by this guy because he seems to know what he's talking about anyway thank you Andre and I'm going to cover some of the links that you sent me okay so here's one link that got sent to me and I was almost in disbelief when I saw it I wasn't sure to I wasn't sure what to make of it but apparently this is Vladimir Putin being shown some historical maps of the ter territory we understand as Tartaria and I'll just translate it to English and I don't want to comment on this too much you'll have to take a look at it yourself I will leave this as the first link in the description below I opened up the transcript which you can do yourself and then translated it to English and it seems to confirm what the title of this video is saying okay so this next video I would like to touch upon is by Sergei Ignatenko and he's already made so many videos on Tartaria but he returned to the subject and created a short 11 or 12 minute video which tried to, a tried to answer the simple question of whether Tartaria was a 
geographical territory written on old maps or whether it was actually an empire. And in this video he presents a lot of source material which he doesn't really cover very deeply but he presents it and he does get to answering this question. My Russian is not good at all. I don't speak Russian but I've learned enough to know that this says Velikai Tartaria Imperia Ili Territoria. So he's asking, well I'll translate it to English, and it says Great Tartaria, Great Tartary, was it an em was it an empire or was it a territory? Now I'm not wasting any time. This is a spoiler. This is kind of an answer to the question and at about eight minutes into his video he shows some flags of old states and I think this is from the years 1760 around there which I know is actually problematic now that I'm aware that Anatoly Fomenko's new chronology has come out and people are questioning timelines I realize there are some some contradictions with these old years but I'm not going to go into that you'll just have to bear with any chronological problems or contradictions that come up too many words okay so Sergei Ignatenko in his video starts looking at a few different charts of old flags uh, this is French so it says pavillon which just means flag in French of Tartary and this is a flag of the Emperor of Tartar and well you can see it just as well as I can so the Emperor flag has a griffin on it and the regular ordinary flag seems to have an owl on it. And this alone perhaps shows and demonstrates that Tartary or Tartaria was actually an empire or at least a government because why else would you have flags? Would you have flags merely for a geographical territory? Well that's debatable but that's one of the arguments Sergei makes in his video. I'm going to go back to the beginning and try to cover everything he presents. Now the reason I didn't just translate this video is because I found a problem. So Sergei Ignatenko is actually translating documents from the French language and a few other languages so if I was going to translate what he said I'm translating a translation which to me is a bit of a problem and it made it difficult to make a video on. He starts by saying that Wikipedia tends to say Tartary, Tartaria was a geographical territory. and by that I think we can assume that the popular mainstream understanding of Tartaria is that it was merely a geographical territory. I have yet to look at all of this material myself but these are the documents Sergei Ignatenko suggests we should look at and he starts with the Bibliothèque Orientale ou Dictionnaire Universal of the continent. This translates as the Library of the Eastern Dictionary Universal and it's written by Antoine Galland 1646 to 1715. Now if you're into Anatoly Fomenko you might have some problems with that. I have no opinion on this yet. Sergei seems to say that 
it doesn't go into great detail but there is a general history in French which covers Tartaria and in this Antoine Galland book there is listed different emperors which starts getting at the different khans or khanates within Tartary. He's saying that this is generally in the time period of about the third century. This book seems to explain the overall word of what Tatar means, but it also gets more specific as to the different khanates and just from what I can see it's talking about the Turks which don't necessarily mean the people of present-day Turkey because there's Turkic people and then there's the people of Turkey which arguably are kind of similar but they actually mean different things and that's worth going into greater discussion about but I won't here and it mentions Japhet so this is almost getting into biblical kind of references I think better look that up and then you've got Mongols or Mughals mentioned which were a ruling empire in well maybe the Mughal area but also in northern India and Nepal and these places just from the history I've read and you've got Bukha Khan well you can read these as well it's generally saying that there were two different brothers twin brothers I think one who started the Mughal Empire and then I guess it separated into eight different Khanates and then they merged back together and created a single dynasty I might have it a little bit wrong so I stopped being lazy and I took this French and I went to an image to text conversion put it into French and then I went to Google Translate and for some reason in this old text sometimes the letter F is actually the letter S and I have an opinion about that too because I actually think this difference between the letter F and S marks a previous epoch kind of distinguishing ancient writing from modern I haven't proven that but now that I'm thinking about it I thought I'd share that with you feel free to disagree okay anyway I translated this myself and I will just read hopefully I'll save this and leave this as text in the description so we are translating this text once again okay Oh, oh, the phone's ringing. Okay, hold on. Okay, so I will just try and read this. The library under the title of Tatar. Tatar and Tatar Khan, name of a son of Ilingay Khan, fifth king of Turkestan of the posterity of Turk, son of Japheth. I pulled it up here. You might want to look at this yourself, particularly if you're someone who's interested in the Old Testament of the Bible. Japheth was the son, was a son of Noah, and Noah, or, or sorry, Japheth also had children. Well, you can look at those yourself. You might want to look that up if that's interesting to you. I'll read this again. Tatar and Tatar Khan, name of the son of Ilingay Khan, fifth king of Turkestan of the posterity of Turk, son of Japheth, he came into the... who are we talking about? Tatar and Tatar Khan. Okay. He came into the world with his twin named Mogul or Mogul. And these two brothers founded two great empires famous in the east, which later met in one. So you have 
the east and the west, and they eventually meet as one. The dynasty knew of eight Khans. Ilinge Khan, Tatar Khan, Buka Khan, Bilinge Khan, Isali Khan, Aksur Khan, Urdu Khan, Sunik Khan, Siddiq Khan, No Shaka Khan. That was a joke. After the death of Sunik, the civil and foreign wars divided so much the nations of Tartars, and the great empire was entirely abolished, although the Tartar families always separated from the other Turaic nations of the east. Today, the Turks are given the name of Tatar Khan to the Sultan who commands the little Tartars of Crimea. Crimea. I don't want to get off track, and I haven't investigated it yet myself, but I think it would be interesting to look at all of these different cons, and you could almost investigate that and make a video all on that subject. Okay, Sergei Ignatenko mentions another book, also in French. I'll pause it. Supplement or Supplement à l'Atlas Historique. Tome uh, 7 and Dernier. And uh, this is from 1718 to 1722. And in this book, in this atlas, there are whole paragraphs devoted to the history of the Khans. So I guess there's a family tree of Chinese emperors. There's also a type of family tree or genealogy of the Tsars of Muscovy and Great Russia. And there's a genealogy of the ancient emperors of Tartaria and descendants of Genghis Khan. So then, Sergei Ignatenko makes a statement and says something like, if Tartaria was merely a territory, then why give a genealogy or a lineage or a family tree which explains it all? So in other words, you know, if this is just a territory, why have a genealogy? Here's Timur. Just notice that here. Buka Timur, one of the Khans, was Buka Khan. I haven't really looked at this fully yet. This is this is his video called Ovalikoi Tartari Zemulvite Slovo. Slovo is word, so this is like of Great Tartari, uh, maybe say the word. Okay, I, I'm not going to lie to you. I looked that up on Google Translate before I told you that. I wanted you to think I understood this. Okay, now Sergei Ignatenko is referencing another source here, and he's saying that here's another source that goes into explaining the origin of the term Tatar, and this is from Birkin Meyer's book in 1729. And this book tends to suggest that the word Tartary comes from a river called Tartar, and it, it is apparently from the Chinese language. That's just one idea. Okay, now this is helpful, but I'm not going to give much description. Sergei Ignatenko is just covering some of the already understood maps that we have, and this one is from Gerard Mercator, which, if you've read history, you might be familiar with that name. Okay, on this particular map of Tartaria, Sergei Ignatenko is tending to say that there's actually a great river or even like ocean, Mare 
Congestatu Tartaricum, and maybe that's where Tartaria gets its name. Now, Sergi is not saying this. I'm actually saying this, and I'm just noticing it now, so I will cover it. I've read in other encyclopedic accounts of Tartaria that the entire land mass somehow has a name attached to it of Kambalu, which is related to a flounder type of flatfish, which I guess is kind of a pictographic name for this entire land mass, which I guess is compared to this flatfish. But now that I'm seeing it, yeah, Kambalu, that's something worth pointing out. Colmax, you know, is that the Kalmix? These are groups of people. Scythia. Scythia, I guess that's, according to history, associated with a Persian type of people that was actually conquered, maybe even extinguished, by the Mongol horde. So you've got Scythia mentioned. And there's another chart that I'll actually show in a minute that associates Scythia with Tartaria. Now I don't want to get off into mythology or Gnostic stuff, but I suppose if that's something you're interested in, I know that like Seth is a character in the Adam and Eve story as like some, you know, in the line of children. And Sethian might be associated with like Scythia. I'm not saying that, but it, it might come to your mind. Here you have Magog and Gog. Yeah, so here you have like Gog and Magog written on this map of Tartaria. And I already pulled it up, but Magog was one of the sons of Japheth. It says that on this Wikipedia article, I cut it off. And you know, here's the curse of Ham and all this stuff. Okay, this is good. He highlighted it in yellow. So you, ha you have Tartar Fluvius, or Sluvius, Fluvius, which I guess is the Tartar River. So you have the, the Tartar Ocean, the Tartar River, and you've got Tartar mentioned again with this Sumongul Magog city. Sergi seems to be saying that that map we were just looking at actually has some description that goes along with it. I think that's what we're looking at here. Okay, now he moves on to another source, which is Abraham Ortelli. I guess in Latin it's Ortelius. And it looks like he's created some maps on Tartaria as well. This one is from 1571. Okay, this is a different map, and the author of it seems to be Anthony Jenkinson, although it also seems to be associated with Abraham Ortelius from 1570, and it looks like, according to the description, in the transcript, this is talking about Muscovy, Tartary, more specifically. So here's Crimea down here. That's the I guess there's also some map descriptions. I'm not following what's being spoken here. I couldn't completely understand what Sergei was saying here, but he's kind of saying like these are these maps are written by Renaissance period authors and here you have Muscovy or Russia within the area of Tartaria or Tartary, and here's a portrait of one of the great Khans. And there's an owl symbol. That we know that was on the flag of Tartary. Again, I'm not sure what's being said here, but Sergei is pointing us to one of the videos he made before, which is Pravitelli, Pravitelli Tar, Tari e Moscovi. So I don't know if this is one of the Muscovy rulers of Tataria? I'm not sure that's what it's saying. 
And I guess there's this concept that the great Khan hid his name at birth so as to conceal his true identity. It's an idea dropped here. There is a belief that the enemy does not know the name of the ru ruler and thus becomes invulnerable. That's a very neat idea. Okay, here's a different map and the one thing that's being pointed out is that North America is being designated as empty. Here's Sh Shalago. Well, I won't try to read this stuff. Okay, Sergei in some of his previous videos, um, actually one of his videos on Great Tartaria, he does a four-part series, he begins discussing the colonization, or at least the exploration of Siberia by a character called Yermak, and Yermak himself is maybe roughly, very crudely compared to Christopher Columbus, as in we're not really sure that Christopher Columbus existed or was really the first one to discover Siberia just in that comparison. That's not Sergei Ignatenko's words, those are mine, uh, but there is reason to doubt that a Yermak ever existed and so now Sergei is going into trying to explain why Siberia on this map really isn't given very much description and the answer is that Yermak apparently had not yet discovered this area of the map at this point in time. I don't know. So Siberia was considered a terra incognita at this time. Okay, this is a map by a Frenchman, Pierre Duval, in 1645. Well, this isn't really a map, is it? But it depicts all of the different countries. Here's Britannique, Hungary, Greece, Grec, and Lithuania, Poland. And the next point he's going to make is that Tartary, here it is here, is often associated with Kambalu. I don't know what language that is. I don't know if that's Russian. But Tartaria is associated with the shape of a flounder fish. And that's what a Kambalu is, which I guess is actually a city or territory as well. That's the point being made here. Okay, so this is um, cartography by Johann Baptist. What was the name? It says Homan here. That's not his name. Okay, that is written in English, I guess. Homan. John Johann Baptist Homan. And this is from 1716, and these are maps of the world. And here you have, well, this is written in German. I'll pause it. Uh, Tartaristian Kaisers. That's an interesting word. I want to make a separate video just discussing that word. I don't know if I'll ever get to it, but I don't want to touch that one for now and change the nature of this video. So anyway, Tartaristian Kaisers, and this is the, well, Kaisers, because a Kaiser is a leader, isn't it? You had, hold on, you've got Kaiser Wilhelm, who's associated with the First World War. I'll try to get an image. So here he is here. So we do have a concept of what a Kaiser is. Even still, the word Tsar, if you look at the spelling of it, it's speculated as a, a, a variation of the word Caesar. And I don't want to get too in-depth, and it sometimes upsets people when I talk about the Bible, but uh, Jesus Christ, even in the Gospels, has a quote saying something like, Pay Caesar what Caesar is due. So I'm not being clear here, but there are um, recent history associations with the word Kaiser and even biblical ones. That's my point I'm making. And so we see the same use of the word. You want to read into that? Go ahead. I'm not reading into it. I'm just pointing it out. I don't know what to make of it yet. 
So this is Tartarischen Kaisers, and this was the, we already saw this, this is the emperor flag of Tartaria, and this is um, this just the general flag of Tartarischia, or Tartaria. This is a different uh, book of flags. It's also in French. Tableau des pavillons ou bannières que la plupart des nations aberrant à la mer. So anyway, this is by Jacques Nicolai Cutitoff Balin, something like that from 1765. Pardon my French, but uh, again, same thing. We're we're going to look at the flags, and P A V stands for like flag in French of the emperor of Tartar, and again you've got the well, it's the same thing I in the previous image you've got the flag of Tartary. But once again, I know I already said it, but Sergei is kind of saying, well, hey, if this was just a territory, why do we have nation-state flags for Tartary? Okay, you might not have noticed, but this is an additional chart. This is a different one. This is an even different chart of maritime flags of the 18th century, and same same type of thing. Which I'm not really sure Sergei is, is making this point, but if it has a maritime flag, could it also mean that it had a navy or merchant ships? That's me saying that. I don't think it says that in this video. Okay, this is a timeline by someone who sounds English, Joseph Priestley, from 1733, if I'm seeing that right, to 1804. And what Sergei is going to point out is this area in particular here. It's a timeline. Okay, so I'll just try to read and follow along with what he's saying. Okay, Tartaria is indicated according to this graphics in the first centuries of our Tartary was Sith Scythia. Just pause this. Whoops. I better take a closer look. Sergei linked this article in the description below. And I think what you're seeing up here is the timeline. So here's the 1700s, 1600s, all the way down. It goes down to the year zero. So to see Sith or Sithi, Sithae on the map, is kind of saying that Scythians were sort of around the year zero to, well, we're not really sure, and somehow Tartary is associated with that. You know, you've got other things that I could point out. I haven't studied this closely myself, but you've got the Mughals, which is probably the Mongols, India, the Persians. Here you've got the Mongols and the Tartars kind of associated with Hindustan, which is India. It's the old word for India, Hindustan or Hindustan. Sergei is saying, hey, take a look at this account from 1708 to 1770 or 1805, I'm not sure. But look, there's actually Russian accounts from 1805 that talk about Tartary. Because I guess when people first started tar talking about Tartaria, they were saying it was mostly French language material or other European texts, and Sergei is saying, no, look, here's some Russian language discussion of Tartaria. I guess the one point he makes is that Tartaria is here mentioned, and Tobolsk is listed as the capital. I guess if there's a Russian listener listening, and you can clarify this point, it seems like Sergei is pointing this highlight here, saying that Scythia was associated with the 15th century, and then this part of Great Tartary was conquered by Russia. Ru uh, that's Russia there. Okay, so maybe you can, if you can, actually, yeah, if you don't mind, it's just a sentence, and if you're Russian, you can speak Russian, you can understand this, please let me know what this says here. Okay, this is a different source, and Sergei is saying in the Russian State Library, there's also a book which was originally French and it was from 1692. 
I think this map is contained in that book. Not 100% sure. Interesting uh, symbol up here. But uh, this is a new map of the Siberi, which is like Siberia, and of Kitai. If you're not familiar with that, Kitai is China and even Russians use the word Kitai to describe China but that shouldn't be such a shock because I think even in English historically China was associated with the word Kathai C-A-T-H-Y so it's a very similar word okay so I guess associated with this particular map you had three Frenchmen although that doesn't look like a French name you have like Stanislaus Jablonowski, so that sounds like a Polish name. And I guess there was a Russian and Polish expedition to protect the Christian faith and to collect information in the Great Tartaria. And here it's called an empire. Well, I better pause that. I guess, whoops, I better pause it. Okay, yeah, so the point that's being made here is that even in this old expedition, maybe you'd call it, that Tartaria is referred to as Empire par le Grand Tartary, so it's referred to as an empire. And I guess they went to uh, Chinese Tartary. If that's confusing, hopefully I'll get to it later in this video, how all of these different ethnic groups and geographical regions are associated with Tartary. Well, I might as well say it now. Hopefully, I'll get to proving it later. But yes, like Muscovy, uh, Tibet, China, Manchuria, the Tongut people, and kind of the Eurasian type of Asian people, Mongolians, are associated with this area of Tartary and going down to the extent of places like. Sergei says, unfortunately, that in these pictures of the expedition the images are very small this is something I've been studying separately and that's all the different ethnic groups of the vast area of Tartary and Kalmuks or Kalmyks are one of the peoples here's a separate source that is presented from the name is cut off Antonius Basu and this book is from 1857 to 1859 and I think the point that Sergei is making is that by this point in history Great Tartari has ceased to exist so it's already extinct at this point I actually read a separate account in one of the resources that Sergei presented in the description below of his video and it was another resource about Tartaria from the year 1848 and it sort of says the same thing so that actually might clarify things for you if you're wondering well when did Tartary or Great Tartaria cease to exist well it seems that around the 1840s 1850s this empire was already finished Here's another map from 1717 from Nicolaus Whitson and Nicolas San Sanson. Okay, and I think the point Sergei is making at this point is that I, th I stand to look at this closer, but this is a more recent map, and maybe more recently they've started to use this term Tartari, and they're sort of using it more as a geographical distinction rather than a state or an empire. Okay, here's another source. Okay, so this is going back in time to 1683, so Tartaria was probably an empire at this point. Uh, the chapters and the contents in the second book of the description of the universe, and it's on Asia and I guess Sergei has highlighted in the of the Grand Tartary and Koms of the Emperors of Tart 
history. So maybe that's cons. So this book talks about the cons of Tartary. Here's another source. I won't read it. Okay, that, that actually finishes off Sergei Ignatenko's video. And hopefully I did justice to it and covered it properly. So thank you very much, Sergei. I appreciate what you did. And um, if you're listening, uh, well, not Sergei, but if my audience is listening, um, maybe you'll consider going to Sergei's videos and watching a few and even giving them a thumbs up. Okay, I will try and somehow leave this as a link in the description below. How I came across this book was it was actually a link in one of Sergei Ignatenko's video descriptions. Actually, it was in the video, the video of his that I just covered. But strangely, Sergei did not actually address this book in his video for whatever reason. Well, that's okay. But I actually spent maybe four or five hours last night just taking a look at this book. I want to try and get right to the point. I don't want to talk on and on here. But this is on Gallica, Gallica, and it's on Tartaria. I'll try to find the year for it. 1848. And the nice thing about it is that on the Gallica website, it's actually already translated, although it's in French, but it's actually, it takes the text and it translates it. So then I took the text and I put it into Google Translate, and I was able to go page by page and understand this text. Now, the problem I had with it is once again, I already mentioned that by this point in time, which is 1848, the historical or ancient empire of Tartaria, whatever it was, was already extinct or kind of a finished thing at this point. Yes, there are maps of it, but it's over at this point. So really, if you go into studying and copying and pasting this into Google Translate and reading about Tartary from this book in the year 1848, you aren't going to get much as far as what the historical empire was all about. You are more or less going to get modern expeditions from around 1848, mostly from English people, translated into French. So you'll get a lot of history, not even history, almost like news accounts of what's going on in areas, well, this book is about Afghanistan, but it's also going to talk about Bhutan and Nepal. And actually, I found that the first 30 pages tended to talk about places like Bukhara and Samarkand and this Turkestan kind of area. So I could start covering this material and show you what I came up with. But really, it's too much later in time. And I don't think it's really that helpful in exploring the historical empire of Tartary. There does seem to be maybe a carryover of these old khanates, or yeah, khans, from the ancient time to this more modern one in 1848, but I still have to sort that one out. Okay, that's a lot of talking. Okay, the most interesting things that I was able to take from this book were actually from the very first page, because the very first page does address some of the prehistory, so to speak, of Tartary, kind of like pre pre 1848 when this book was written. So I will pull up the Word document, and I actually took this text, and I, which is pasted here, and I copy this, put it into Google Translate, and this is kind of what I came up with and it's from the French to the English. I'm not really a French speaker. My French isn't very good. So I'm just going to read aloud what this first page of the French text says. And it's probably partially wrong, translated wrong. I'll start a new video.
I'm just going to get reading. So this, this, and this is the same thing. So I just translated this. Okay. It should give you the general idea. It's not a perfect translation. And there's no pictures. Sorry. Towards the end of the last century, rather the 1790s, a romantic interest was attached to the name of Tartary. It was in this vast area during a time not within memory before barbarian peoples. Presently, many people, excuse me, many scholars now cannot trace places like Buffon or Bailey, or rather cradles of human humankind. Buffon or Bailey, cradles of humankind. And if you listening can tell me what Buffon or Bailey are, I would love to know, because I don't know what these are references to, which parts of the map. Bali? Probably not. These places were the former sanctuary of arts, science, and civilization. Just talking generally about Tartaria. Today, the critical historian has spread these errors to a lively craze. The critical historian is passionate for new paradoxes for the sake of modern science. Don't forget this is writing at the time of 1848. Tartary now appears to us like the story before the vain system advocated by Longley and refuted by Abel Remusa. Langley is actually an English guy which reveals the invasions of Attila, Genghis Khan, and Timur. So that's talking about the Golden Horde conquering all of Asia and Tartary and all that. Of all the epochs, as in our days still, the immense country, Tartaria, had for its inhabitants crude forefathers, bloodthirsty hordes, and ignorant superstitious tribes. The prestige, glory, and antiquity of Tartary has vanished without return. The people of the past in Central Asia have escaped our knowledge and veneration, and they deserve to become the object of our studies in our present time. Tartary cannot for long escape the influence of the arms and civilization of Europe. Russian caravans and embassies crisscross the steppes of Turkestan. England sends to these same countries Burns, Abbott, Stoddart, and Connolly. These are like expedition guys with pen and paper recording notes. These fearless men, or intrepid men, how it describes it in the French, these fearless men and unfortunate precursors of a regeneration will advance the epoch through their writings and efforts. The present and future of Tartary is all the public has paid serious attention to. Not the past. He's saying the future and the present is all we're really looking at these days, in 1848. This is amidst the various accounts of England and Russia's policy towards different states of Central Asia. These accounts have influenced the work we are publishing. This is the French authors talking in 1848. We will try to explain the country and its inhabitants, the good and the bad that exist in men and in the institutions. We won't discuss the history of the past. Okay, so a few words, and these are just a few of my comments. I don't know if you like my opinions, but you get it anyway. Um, okay, so English guys, why are there English people in Tartary? Well, you have to understand that India, the subcontinent, was an English colony. Same with other areas like Nepal. So this is why you've got English people in Tartary, just in case you were wondering that. And of course you've got Russia colonizing all the way to the Pacific. But the things that I just wanted to point out is kind of the language that the author is using and sor sort of the mindset of the author writing this. First of all, he is using terms like the regeneration so he's saying these English guys who are writing about Tartary are the, are the precursors of a regeneration. And go look at the French if you don't think that's what it says. But we're talking about regenerating a continent, or Great Tartaria. Strange language. And once again, there's a distinction between the past and the present, and that somehow the past of Tartary was associated with science,
that got cut off. But the point is that um, even these authors writing are distinguishing a historical glory age of Tartary in terms of arts, science, and civilization. And it's kind of saying that all of that is of no trace. You can't find it anymore and there's no memory of it and it's not even really connected with and actually the French writings uses the word immemorial so Great T Tartari is not even within memory it's immemorial and that's an entirely different subject that I would love to investigate later you've heard a common idiom or expression since times immemorial well, I'm actually going to tell you that that's a legal definite that's a legal concept and if you study law times immemorial has a very specific definition in Black's legal dictionary and that's an interesting topic to me because it it would almost indicate that maybe there's a time of which no previous memories of the past exist. Okay, if you really want to know what I'm saying, I'm saying there's a reset with no continuity to the past. You've got ancients and moderns. Okay, I don't want to keep going. That's getting into the realm of crazy talk. I just want to talk about Tartary. Okay, so back to the book. This is what I tried to translate, and it's not perfect. Refer to the French if you don't believe what I said. Okay, so now I went to page two, and I was just going through this myself last night, and I just left some notes as to what each of these pages say. Okay, so this page two kind of defines the reunion of certain geography and several nations. And the groups that it mentions are Chinese Tartary, uh, Manchuria, which is like the absolute eastern part of China. In World War II, you have, according to history, you've got the Japanese invading Manchuria. You might know more about that than I do. Mongolia. Zungaria, uh, maybe I'm saying that wrong too, but Zungaria is actually the northern northern portion, the northern half of China. Turkestan, Turkestan is like Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, and all those states below Kazakhstan used to be one region. Even in Soviet times, Turkestan was like a conglomeration of all those smaller states. Little Bukhari. Again, if you watched my previous video, that's Uzbekistan, Chinese Turkestan, and Tibet. And boy, would I love to investigate exactly what Tibet was. But anyway, once again, if you want to read the French, go back to the original article. It talks about all the different nations. Everything I just mentioned is kind of here. And then it goes into talking about the different races of the peoples in Tartary and it kind of distinguishes the people between Mongol and Caucasian. And even the French language, if you go read it, it actually says that Caucasians are assumed to have originated from Mount Caucasus. It doesn't say Caucasian mountains, it actually specifically re refers to a Mount Caucasus, or Caucasus, or however you want to say it. And I guess this Caucasian race of Tartary people includes Turks and Persians. That's according to the author. Tartar seems to be a designation imposed by a larger, more powerful tribe. It says these things. And it's kind of, again, this, is artic this, this book was written at a later date, 1848, and it's now talking more in terms of geographical territory. And you can see that in things sentences such as like Manchus and Tibetans aren't necessarily Tatars. Hmm. I probably won't cover this too much. Uh, one thing I did see a lot of reference to, and not even in just this book, but this concept of Khazars, and I've got to be careful addressing that one because I know the things that are associated with it and I don't even want to go there, but uh, even in Tajikistan, you've got the Hazare people, or the Hazaras, which is a Persian group, and those people are today in Afghanistan. So I'm just wondering if there's a connection with all these people. Even Turkish people today in Turkey call the Caspian Sea Hazar.
it on the screen. This I thought was a good reference because on page 5 it starts talking about the different Khanates and it mentions them Kunduz, Kokand, Kokand is probably in Uzbekistan somewhere around there, Hisar again a word like Hisar is interesting to me because it sounds a lot like Hazar Hazar is associated with the area of Transcaucasia and that's a whole different debate but Hazar is an interesting word because it comes up an awful lot. There's a place in Tajikistan and there's a mountain range called the Hisor mountain range and even things like in Europe you've got Hungarian and Polish military units like the Hungarian Hussars and the Polish Hussars. You could look those things up separately. Is there some kind of connection to the area of Transcaucasia which is in Great Tartary? These are the things I'm thinking about. Anyway I'm going off onto like too many different tangents, but I wrote these down, which is page 5, and you've got these Khanates, like the Bukhara Khanate, okay, so that's Uzbekistan, the Khanate of Kiva, I think this is associated with Turkmenistan of present day, uh, the Khanate of Kunduz. Kunduz is actually a city in northern Afghanistan today, and apparently I had a note myself to check this out. Okay, so the next one here was... Oh, here's the note to self to check out the Kokand Khanate in Uzbekistan. Again, I'm gathering all this information from page 5 of that French book on Tartary from 1848. Well, I haven't read this. Maybe I'll leave this in the link in the description below, but there's actually a concept even on Wikipedia for the Khanate of Kokand. And that's worth looking at because, I don't know, do we have a carryover from the ancient Tartary to the modern times where we still have a Khanate of Kokand? It's something I ask. I, I haven't decided on what that's all about yet. Okay, here we have the Khanate of Hisar. I'm not saying that word is all connected, but it comes up in different forms all the time. Two similarities to Khazar. Not, I'm not being clear, I know that. Okay, so I'm getting off topic from my subject, but this is just stuff, like note to self stuff to go look into later. I guess in Tajikistan, maybe close to Uzbekistan, there's this Gisar mountain range, but it's also known as the Hisar or Hisor mountain range. I think I've already made it clear that these are interesting words to me. Khazret Sultan. Uh, there's also a Hanukkah River in western Tajikistan which passes through the town of Hisor. Again, words like Hazar. <laughs> Just saying, this stuff is... Maybe it's etymology, maybe I'm deluding myself with wordplay, but I'm seeing this word come up a lot. Um, Hanukkah is an interesting word because, well, you have this word Khan in Hanukkah, and then, like, you have even the word Cohen, which is a popular last name, does it derive from the word Khan? Right? Even in pe people in... A lot of people in Pakistan have the last name Khan. Even uh, be the difference between Russians and Ukrainians. Uh, Ukrainians and Russians tend to mix up their H sounds and G sounds. So, like, the Russian word for head is Galava. I know Ukrainians say Halava. Just to prove the point that Russians, Ukrainians tend to mix up the G sound and the H sound. So this is maybe where you get today uh, last names like Kagan. Kagan is like Cohen, and it's like that the G being mixed up between Russian and Ukrainian. So there's, I think there's something to this. In in Sufism, which is like a mystical tradition of Islam, you have these uh, almost like meetings where you get together and that's called a Hanka. These are just very interesting words. I don't know what it all means, but I'm just saying that the etymology and the word similarity just doesn't seem arbitrary to me. Sorry to use big words. Okay, there's other things I could cover. Unfortunately, this, this book covered a lot of what I think is boring material and stuff that I don't think is terribly related to Tartaria. So I won't cover this book anymore.
So I'm not sure how to end off this video with a conclusion. I don't have one yet. I've just sort of dumped all the Tartaria info that I could into what you've seen already. But anyway, I'd just like to show you what I've been looking at lately. And I've been investigating into the ethnic groups and the people who are in present-day Tartaria, for lack of a better word. So, Transcaucasia, Eurasia, you know, Russia from all the way to the Pacific, and there's so much to know about, so much to learn. There's all kinds of ethnic groups, and I'm having to learn on about people like the Nogai, Tonguts, Kalmuks, and all these different types of people. I found an old book, I forget what year it's from, oh, 1875, uh, The Land of the Tsar by O.W. Wall, and I've been recording these and just posting them on my channel as unlisted videos, and I've made a ton of them. Uh, here's a video talking about the Osets, Persians, Kurds, Russians, Gypsies, and Jews, and this one's about Cossacks and Poles, and the various chapters, and I'm just going to leave those as a huge list in the link in the description below for somebody who might be interested in that. Um, why, why am I really looking at that? Well, I am looking for some kind of remnant people from Great Tartary, Tartary. Like, is there a carryover? Are these people that are in Tartaria today, do they have lineage to the great empire that we are told existed? Okay, and there is one point I really wanted to make, and I'm not going to go into it at length, just a single statement. 